The weather was unusual that late October day in 1981. Very hot, bright, and sunny like today. But it was business as usual right here at the Nanuet Mall. Behind me used to be the Nanuet National Bank. There was a Brinks truck there making its final pickup for the day. Again, business as usual until all hell broke loose. I have a problem at Nanuet National in the mall. Our armored truck was shot at. All right. Do you know if anybody was uh, hurt? Or? I don't know. It's just people were running all over the place. All right. Can you hold on? Yeah. I'm going to need an ambulance. Somebody just, somebody just yelled out, I need an ambulance. Shit. Nanuet National Bank in the mall. Somebody shot at an armored car. And it got a guy wounded. And somebody's been hit. Requesting an ambulance, sir. Step it up, please. Right, can I get your last name? Horan. H-O-R-A-N. Okay, 323 to all cars and stations, stand by for one alarm on an armed robbery. It's just a card, now you more. On October 20th, 1981, at approximately 3.55 in the afternoon, began a bizarre and violent series of events that would leave three people dead, others wounded, and an entire community in fear of further bloodshed for years to come. The Brinks truck picking up the day's deposits, $839,000 from the Nanuet National Bank at the mall had been robbed. In the process, guard Peter Page had been killed and Joe Trambino had been seriously wounded. The perpetrators had been well organized and heavily armed, evidenced by their ability to blast these huge holes through the armored car's supposedly bulletproof windshield. What no one knew yet was how well organized they were and how heavily armed. They loaded nearly $1.5 million into this red van and disappeared heading towards Middletown Road. It was at this point that an alert young woman, Sandy Turgeson, who lived in a house behind the old Corvettes on Route 59, now service merchandise, made this call. And it's all open and all I saw was a yellow Honda sedan and a U-Haul truck. Yellow Honda with the U-Haul? Someone was holding a gun. Although details of the robbery were still rather sketchy, the police had at least a lead. They were now on the alert for a U-Haul truck and a yellow Honda Accord. However, they still had no real description or even number of the perpetrators. The only thing to do was to set up roadblocks at possible escape routes and wait. The Nyack police knew that a major escape route from Rockland could be this busy intersection of Route 59, Waldron Avenue, and the New York State Thruway. Sergeant Edward O'Grady and Detective Arthur Keenan left the old Nyack police station together and headed for that fateful intersection. Already near the intersection, officers Brian Lennon and Waverly Chipper Brown were on high alert. All four Nyack police officers met at the same time when Chip Brown spotted a U-Haul truck. We've got a U-Haul truck right there. We're going to pull over a U-Haul truck that's uh, going into the throughway here. Do you have a description of the people? I mean, go up and make sure he doesn't get on the throughway ramp. 201, do you have any description on the suspect? So at this time, what we have is a yellow Honda and a U-Haul trailer or truck. We'll get to you as soon as we have it. Okay, just make sure that U-Haul truck doesn't get on the throughway, Brian. We'll pull him over as soon as we get behind him. These would be the last public words for Waverly Brown and Ed O'Grady as the four Nyack policemen pulled into position. Lennon blocking the throughway, Brown, O'Grady, and Keenan coming up from behind. I had uh, given a, uh, a quick inspection of the cab of the truck, and uh, Sergeant O'Grady. Officer uh, Brown and Officer Lennon were off to the side here with the two occupants of the cab of the vehicle. Um, I had walked around the back of the truck and attempted to open the rear overhead door and uh, it wouldn't open. I then uh, was walking over to tell Sergeant O'Grady I wanted to see what was in the back of that truck and that's when uh, I heard a noise from the back of that truck. Um, it sounded like something fell down in the truck. And uh, 
I turned around and at that time individuals were jumping out of the back of the truck and firing at us. My first interest was in uh, the two officers that were down. Uh, I went immediately to the closest one to me, which was uh, Officer Waverly Brown, um, who at that point I determined was seriously hurt. Um, I was unable to get a pulse. Um, so then, I, then from him I went over to uh, Sergeant O'Grady, who was also down, and uh, I picked up his service revolver, which he was in the process of reloading. Art Keenan and Brian Lennon fought hard against superior firepower and survived. Chip Brown was hit with automatic weapons fire and died almost instantly. Sergeant Ed O'Grady was shot down trying to reload and was mortally wounded. He would die a short time later at Nyack Hospital. One gunman tried to slip away and was captured by an off-duty New York corrections officer, Michael Koch. The other gunman commandeered a vehicle and joined the Honda which was nearby as they flew up Mountain View Avenue in a desperate attempt to escape. South Nyack Police Chief Alan Colsey was waiting. I took a U-turn and went back down 59 to 9W, 9W up to Christian Herald uh, Road in Upper Nyack, and then Christian Herald heading back towards Mountain View, which is, I knew that that's where Mountain View would have to bring them out to. And I made a K-turn in the middle of Mountain View Avenue. Just as I was completing my K-turn, almost wiping out the front of my car there was a large white Buick that came at a, again a high rate of speed traveling in the same direction as the Honda. This vehicle had previously been described as uh, one of the vehicles that the suspects were seen fleeing in. Colsey pursued the two vehicles through Upper Nyack until they reached this intersection at 6th and Broadway. The Buick negotiated the turn, the Honda did not crashing into this wall. Colsey ordered the three occupants out and took them into custody. The Buick traveled south and disappeared. This 9mm pistol was found on the floor of the car. At this time, neither Colsey nor any other policeman had any inkling as to the depth of the conspiracy they had uncovered. And I don't think any of us really comprehended the significance when it first happened of who the people were in the Brinks case. We knew that there was a terrible, terrible tragedy in Rockland County. A Brinks guard was killed. Uh, two outstanding police officers were murdered, but we really didn't know who was behind this, who these people were, and everything just came to a head so quickly where we realized that these were a group of individuals, a group of revolutionaries that had come to Rockland County of all places with a desire to steal funds, to kill police officers, to create this new nation of the Republic of New Africa. And essentially it was something that caught local law enforcement off guard, state law enforcement and the national, uh, I'd say the FBI and every other group was literally caught off guard that these conspirators were out there and they were ready to uh, do anything possible to obtain funds to create this new nation. Captured that day were Kathy Boudin, an occupant in the U-Haul apprehended sneaking from the scene of the shooting. Also captured, the three occupants of the Honda which crashed at 6th and Broadway, David Gilbert, Judith Clark and Samuel Brown. All except Brown were known radicals with ties to the violent activist group known as the Weather Underground. Captured shortly after were Donald Weems and Nathaniel Burns, members of the Black Panthers and both violent fugitives. Captured nearly four years later was the driver of the White Buick and another known radical, Marilyn Jean Buck. What came out in a trial that spanned three counties, lasted over three years, and cost the Rockland taxpayers nearly five and a half million dollars, the most expensive trial in New York State history, was a plan by a group of misguided activists to create a new land from five former slave states. This land, New Africa, would be the heart of the black power movement. Their code name for this paramilitary operation we call the Brinks case was the Big Dance. All were tried and convicted in one of the most highly publicized trials in U.S. history. All, with the exception of Kathy Boutine, are serving life sentences without the hope or desire for parole. They were stopped because men like Chip Brown and Ed O'Grady stopped them. Their sacrifice will not be forgotten, not after 10 years, not ever. I have occasion very frequently uh, to visit the grave sites of both uh, Sergeant O'Grady and, and uh, Officer Chip Brown. And um, I just pray that we don't have to see anything like this, or anyone has to see anything like this ever again. 
it's important that we don't forget the memory of these people because they really died um, to defend ourselves here in our community. I think a chip and Eddie. For Ion Rockland, this is Frank Labuona. One eight eight eight. There comes a time in life when it's important to look back on where you've been and smile. What lies ahead? Well, you have much to look forward to. Sometimes you may need a boost. Well, you're graduating, but don't kid yourself. There will still be restraints. So keep your eyes on the road and buckle up, because it's going to be the ride of your life. Call 1-800-441-1888.